Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll begin anyway, okay? Sure. Perfect. Um, so can you, can everyone see that? Okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks Karen for um, the invite and thanks to Diego for connecting me with you, Karen. You're extremely friendly and very positive, so it's great. Um, I'm here just to talk about financial planning. Um, and uh, I, I actually lived in, where well, I didn't live in Venezuela, but my uh, parents lived in Venezuela there um, in 2002. 2003 so I visited Venezuela a couple of times and I have to say it was a beautiful country and very nice happy people so um, I love the arepas and what is it chevre you like to use chevre the word chevre <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully hopefully this presentation is chevre yes <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll try my best <laughs> um, so okay Oh, I can't. Okay. So people, during the pandemic, people were very worried about money. And actually, in April of last year, worried about money was the fourth top thing for people's worries. So um, since then, it's dropped down quite a bit. Um, and people are less worried about money, but it's still, still quite a, a big thing. 400 million people have typed in worried about money into Google. So I guess one of my jobs today is to try to help people, you know, maybe no one's worried about money in the presentation, but maybe a few people are. Um, I know myself, I, I worry about money every now and again as well. So it's, 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 it's a thing. Um, so the second thing that people type into Google a lot is, so the first thing is worried about money. The second thing is how to stop worrying about money. <laughs> so, um, so which brings me to, what I'm going to talk about. So budgeting and cash flow. It, it, if you can manage your personal finances, um, that will definitely help and alleviate the stress of uh, managing your, your money. And, and hopefully it'll help people worry less about money. Second thing I'm going to talk about is good debt versus bad debt. What is good debt? What is good debt to take on? What, what debt should you not use uh, what, what 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 are examples of bad debt and then talk about everyone's favorite topic i know it's your favorite topic karen isn't it pensions <laughs> um i know pensions are very boring but um they're a necessary evil um, and then i'm going to talk a bit about investing and saving so um and if anyone has any questions we can uh, you know go through questions at the end Okay, so causes of financial stress, unexpected expenses, inability to pay for essentials. Sometimes people take on too much debt and then obviously job loss can be a cause of financial stress. But we're here to, to be positive and to give you uh, ways of managing your money better. So um, a good start to managing your money better is to review your all the money coming in to your bank account, so like your wages and your salary, and then figuring out how much, where is all your money going? So where are your outflows? How much are your fixed costs? So your, your rent, your, your gas bill, your electricity bill, all those bills, how much are they costing you every month? And then your variable costs. Um, you know, uh, Karen mentioned to me, everyone likes Venezuela and rum. So how much is your rum costing you every month? Um, me, for me, my vice is coffee. So how much am I spending on coffee every month? And how much am I spending on takeaways and all this type of stuff? So if you can treat your personal finances like a business, you can organize your money a lot better. Um, so I, I have a budgeting spreadsheet I can drop in the chat box at the end. So if you can organize your, your money, 90% of people don't organize their money um, it's just human nature. But I mean, if you can, it, it will definitely help. Um, so why is it helpful? You can figure out where you're spending your money, where you're overspending. So is more money coming in? And are you spending it all every month? And are you having to dip into your credit card? Um, but if you, I mean, the big thing is with a budget and managing your cash flow is it'll help you stop worrying and it'll put you into control. Um, 
There's a very good book called The Barefoot Investor. It's by this Australian guy um, called Scott Pape. Um, he writes, Two million copies were sold worldwide, um, and he talks about the buckets. So if you can organize your money in buckets, so you have your, your living expense bucket, so your rent, your mortgage, your whatever it costs to, to, to live your life. So that's your living bucket. Then you've got your long-term grow bucket where you might put money into a pension or if you want to buy a second home or a first home or whatever it might be, or maybe buy a holiday home in Spain or maybe go back to Venezuela in the future or whatever it might be. Um, and then you've got your blow bucket, which is your spending bucket. So like your, when restaurants are, or restaurants are open, but like your holidays and you're going on the piss or whatever you might do, or going on all these events that Karen organizes, you know, <laughs> that, that can be your, your blow bucket. So separating your money into different um, accounts is very helpful. So that's the book, The Barefoot Investor, which is very useful, um, or I read it and I learned a good bit. So talking about good debt and bad debt. So good debt, um, examples of good debt would be spending money on education, you're investing in yourself, uh, maybe taking out a loan for a business, your, for your own business, that's a good debt, um, or buying a property or buying a mortgage, or you're using a mortgage to buy a property, you're, you're investing in something that might increase in value over time. Bad debt is debt that depreciates over, like you're buying something, but it decreases in value over time. So a car is a good example of, in my opinion, a, you shouldn't be using debt to buy a car because it depreciates in value. Um, using credit cards or you know, using um, store credit to buy maybe a sofa or whatever um, is, a good example of bad debt. So I just typed into Google um, car loans and the first one that popped up was Avant Money. Um, so they, they charge 6% for a car loan. Um, and so if you were to borrow 20 grand using uh, Avant Money, it would cost you 3,100 in interest. So that's quite high. Um, so you'd be paying back 385 a month. But the big thing with a car is it drops by 40% in value after a year. So you're spending 23 grand and it's going to be probably worth 12 grand after year one. Um, so my, my sister bought a car, was it five, six years ago? She asked my dad and my brother, should she take out a car loan? They said, oh yes, you should definitely take out a car loan. She didn't talk to me. I didn't know about it. <laughs> And um, she regretted it ever since. So, but anyway, um, credit cards. Credit cards are really a really expensive way of spending money. So, I think Bank of Ireland charges up to twenty six percent current currently, and then store credit as well. I remember in college before I worked in finance, I used to ignore my credit cards. Um, I used to max them out and spend money on credit cards, and then credit card statement would come in. I was 21 at the time. I'd crumple it up, throw it in the bin, forget about it. So but that's not a good idea. I learned my lesson <laughs> and um, I'm now working in finance. So isn't it ironic? Um, but don't ignore your credit cards. The debt snowball. So when, we're, when you're looking at your debt and if you have debt, it's important to clear the highest costing debt first. So your credit cards, or if you have a personal loan, or some people may not have any debt, but if you do have debt, try to clear the highest costing debt first, and that'll put you in a better position in the future. So if you have a mortgage, a lot of people just pay what, you know, whatever their payment is. Um, but this, this example just shows you the impact it might have if you pay off more over time. So if you borrowed 350 and it's costing you 1500 a month, the total interest bill is 185,000. But if you increased it to 2,400, your interest bill would be dropped to 86. I'm not saying 2,400 is what you should be paying back, but it's, it's just an example of if you pay in a bit extra onto your mortgage, the long-term effect um, is quite impactful because you pay less in. You pay the bank back less and everyone loves the banks, don't they? <laughs>
Okay, so this is everyone's favorite topic, pensions. Um, yeah, I like when I go to a pub or a restaurant or whatever, and uh, people ask me uh, what you do, and I say pension advisor, it's, uh, it's an immediate conversation killer, so I don't say that. I'm a bit more vague, and I say I manage, I help people manage their money, but uh, pensions are a very important tool to um, help you I think if you think of a pension, it's it's a basically a way of saving for your old age. So when you're 60 or 65, it's probably one of the most efficient ways of saving money for old age. Um, so that's the way to look at it. If you want to save money and stop working when you're 60 or 65, it's it's probably one of the most effective ways you could do so. So everyone's feelings on pensions. Pensions are boring, pensions are complicated, pensions are overwhelming, don't know where to start. Everyone feels that way. I even feel that way. My wife, it took me three years to set her up with a pension. So <laughs> even she felt <laughs> pensions, she felt the same way. Uh, but basically a pension, you put money in, an insurance company manages it, and then you take the money out. Okay, so those are the basic principles, but why are they efficient? So depending on your earnings, if you're earning over 35 grand a year um, and you're on the higher rate of tax, a pension can be very effective. So if you paid in 100 into a pension, it would only cost you 60. So you get 40 euros from the government. If you're on the lower rate of tax at 20%, if you put in 100 euros, it's only costing you 80. So that's really important to understand. You get free money from the government um, if you pay into a pension. So that is really important. So like if you save 100 euros in a pension, it's only costing you 60 or 80, depending on your tax rate. So it's a, a good way of avoiding the tax man. Um, everyone loves to avoid the tax man. But this is a good example of, okay, if you start early in your 20s or 30s and you wanted to hit let's say half a million in a pension uh, a 20 year old would have to pay in 245 euros a month whereas the 30 year old would have to pay in a bit more um, and then obviously in your 50s it's it gets very expensive to to hit a good target this is an example of a 30 or 8 year old male he's starting kind of late um, and he decides to pay in 10 grand into a pension per annum. So he's on the higher rate of tax. It costs him six grand a year because um, he gets 40% relief from the government. So this just shows you, okay, so he pays in 132,000 over uh, 25 years, or sorry, up until the age of 60. He saves 88,000 from the tax man and it grows. That's the free money. That's invested money with, let's say, Zurich. And that's the free money. So um, you can clearly see it's costing him 88,000, but he gets the free growth of, um, sorry, 449. And then the cost to, to, to him or to the, the guy setting up is 132. So remember pensions, the, the benefits are the tax relief, you get the tax-free growth, and then you get your tax-free lump sum at the end. And then at 65 in Ireland, you can earn 18,000 tax-free. So when you're thinking about pensions, you, some people might already have a pension, some people may not have a pension. Some people have financial advisors. You know, there's, I don't know everyone's background in the room, but it's important to think of your retirement number. So what do you want to have in retirement? Like, do you want to stop working? How much money do you need when you retire? Um, and then how do you get there? How much money do you need to save now to get there? In Ireland, you have the state pension of 12 grand a year, which is, which is it, it's probably higher than most countries in Europe. Um, but if you want, you know, 20 grand or 30 grand or 40 grand a year, how are you going to get that difference and how much do you need to pay in now and how much growth do you need to have? Okay, so investing. So if you want to invest your money on in the short term, 
and not invest it in a pension or maybe invest it in conjunction with a pension, you can invest your money. Um, I myself invest through an insurance company. I also invest in a company where called Dejira, where you can buy your own shares, and stocks and shares. Um, Dejira is very cheap. You It costs two euros if you're buying shares in Ireland, and it's very cheap if you buy American shares or UK shares. Um, this is how they compare to other stockbroking firms. Um, yeah, Davy, Good Body, and all the rest are very expensive. Um, the tax when you buy a share or stocks and shares online, um, if you have gains, they're 33%, and you can also earn 1270 a year without incurring any tax. If you were to invest in an insurance company, the tax is 41%. So I actually invest my own money in this fund. Um, it's up 15% last year. And so far this year, it's up 16%. But there's not always good years. Um, the worst year it had in recent times is 2008, where it was down 36%. So my final tips um, today would be make a plan for yourself. Um, if you have an advisor, talk to a financial advisor. If you don't have an advisor, maybe talk to me or talk to, to, to someone or even do it yourself. Um, so just try to make a plan, attack your short-term debt. Um, a lot of people or certain people try to impress others with their with a fancy car or whatever it might be. Um, but a lot of times people with really fancy cars don't have too much money saved up. So I, I think sometimes people, humans try to, try to impress each other, um, but forget about it, trying to impress everyone. Uh, try to save money and put it into different buckets. And ultimately money is just a way of you living a better life. So like it's ultimately to try to give you more freedom um, and to try to do what you wanna do. Um, that's really the key. Uh, and that's why financial planning is useful to give you the life you wanna live. Um, so that is that. That's the presentation. Hopefully, hopefully that was Chevre. Uh, Karen and everyone else. <laughs> I think we have many questions. So I'm, I'm gonna start for the one that we already have in the chat. And then everybody else, if you want to do it yourself, you're more than welcome to do it. So Melissa asked if there's any pension company that would you recommend us to do, to start to do our pension planning and funding? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, like a, a big part of what I do is help people set up pensions. But I mean, insurance, like um, people, I, I, I suppose if someone wants to set up a pension, what they should do is talk to a financial advisor. I am a financial advisor, but I mean, there's no, like, obviously, if they want to talk to me, they can, or they can go online to find a financial advisor, or you can go direct to an insurance company. You can go direct to Zurich or Irish Life, but I would recommend an independent broker. I am an independent broker, but I mean, I suppose the purpose of the presentation is to give you the information so that you're better equipped. Um, I personally think that Zurich are probably one of the best right now. Um, I can send on, I can share, I have performance of all the insurance companies. Um, that might be useful for people, how they've compared to each other. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I have my own pension with Zurich and their performance has been pretty good. So that, that would be the, the question. Yeah. Or is that, I, I don't know, is that answered the question? <laughs> uh, thank you, Melissa, for that. Would you have another question? It's just that I saw you raise your hand, Melissa. Yeah, actually, I have a few, but I don't know if someone else is before me on the questions list. I, I would rather wait. And yes, thank you. That actually answered my question, uh, Jan. Okay. I, have an, I will just wait if there is another question. Otherwise, I, I'll continue. Yeah, continue, Melissa. Then we go for the next guy. Okay, there is a few. Um, uh, it's great that actually not, you're not just a, a financial advisor, but also a, uh, a stock, um, not holder, but... Um, broker. 
Yeah, broker. I also invest with, um, well, almost everyone now does with all these applications, you know, uh, but I currently live in United States. I'm planning to move to Ireland to develop my business. Yet, do the um, I have my social security number? I have my permit, my working permit here, and everything. Yet, I have tried to to start um, uh, with insurance companies over here with um, pension programs, uh, but. I don't know if in Ireland happens the same that do your um, um, legal status, your le I mean, I'm legal here, yet do my status, they actually don't allow um, to start some sort of programs of pension. So my question will be, if you know, uh, if you're from abroad and you would like to start already before actually I get there, because it's it, it, all my papers um, to this business is in progress. So it will be able, or the insurance company will be able to allow me to start that program, like paying me, monthly and stuff from someone that has actually is not living already in Ireland. Okay, so that's a good question. So you're, you, Melissa, you're living in the US, am I right yes, in saying that? Absolutely. Yes, are you, are you, you're, you're living in the US, are you? Yeah, Okay. I'm currently in Washington. Okay, but your intention is to move back to Ireland, is it? Yes. Or sorry, I don't know if you've lived in Ireland before, but um, I, I actually no, I actually did, and, and did? I love okay. how the okay. people is <laughs> I know you guys complain about the weather, but you don't know what you're complaining about. Here is horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, so yeah, well, yeah. I was talking to an Indian client of mine, and he was saying, you know, he loves the weather here. It's nice and mild all year round, but. Um, to answer your question, Melissa, so there's a couple of things, right? So the first thing, it probably doesn't make sense to set up an Irish pension until you're here because irrespective of whether you can or not, you don't get the tax relief if you're not living in the country. Right. Okay, so it doesn't make sense. Um, you would be better off setting up an American pension. Um, the second thing is, I, well, I, the first thing is it wouldn't make sense, number one, unless you're living in the country. The second thing is the insurance companies wouldn't allow it anyway. So um, unless you're living in the country. So and then the third thing is, for whatever reason, the insurance companies in Ireland do not like dealing with anyone living in the US. There's which is a funny one because the US is the worst. I, I don't know why it is, but Ireland and the US when you're investing money, they don't work very well with each other for whatever reason. So um, not that Americans are doing anything dodgy, but <laughs> I don't know why it is, but it, there's a lot of difficulty. I can never set up anyone living in the US um, for anything. Um, and they have a question on the forums, are you living in the US or are you a US citizen? And if you have to answer that. And, because people here sue for anything. Uh, here, is, I believe it's because people here or, or North Americans tend to sue anybody that doesn't actually do whatever they want in the way they want it. Perhaps is that like, why? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe they'll get the, yeah, maybe, maybe it's Irish insurance companies protecting themselves <laughs> from, a, yeah. from American lawyers, maybe. Yeah, that's probably could be. Um, I don't know, does, has that answered your question, Melissa, or, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Thank you so much for taking you that, that time to, uh, to let us know about this. Uh, what would be better, for example, if you are planning to go into a mortgage, we would be better to do the mortgage first, or you can do that in, like, in parallel? In, in, okay, so if you're, are you looking to, to, you're looking to get a mortgage, but are you looking to do something else? Or are you talking no, about these things? The pension. So the pension is something that I always have wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for me, very, very important. But because we are going into, uh, we are looking to, to get in uh, a mortgage. So I don't know if it's something my husband is always saying that it's much better if uh, we do the mortgage first and then we 
I worry about the, the, the pension. But for yeah. me, always that is something in the back of my head. So what are your view about that? It, it's a very good question. So um, the first thing I would say is like, I, I would talk to a mortgage broker. I mean, if you want a mortgage broker or someone I would recommend, I can recommend it one. I don't do mortgages. Um, uh, so like if you're taking out a mortgage, they look at your um, how, where you're spending your money. And if they see a pension or your outgoing, a pension is seen as an outgoing. So they might give you a smaller mortgage. Um, so unfortunately, I, I would say if you're looking to take out a mortgage soon, I would suggest maybe putting off the pension. Uh, but I mean, if it's maybe more medium term, maybe two or three years, what you can do is you can pay into a pension and then stop, take out, take out a mortgage and then start it up again. Um, but it is a good question. But yeah, unfortunately, the banks don't see a pension as a necessarily a good thing. They see it as an expense. I don't know. Is that, is that is, uh, yeah, so your husband is probably right, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, don't don't leave it too long. What? I'm glad he's not here because he'll he gonna say I always write. I always write. <laughs> oh well, yes, yes. So it, it's like a, it's money going out rather than saving. So the bank is not gonna see it as a saving. It's gonna see it as a as an expense. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Any other question, Laura? No, was that and also uh, what are the risks? Because I know that when the Celtic Tiger and all that, so many people were, uh, they lost their, their pensions. So yeah. what are the, the risks of having a, a pension? That's a good question. So, I mean, a lot of people lost their money in the Celtic Tiger because they had their money in Bank of Ireland or AIB or Anglo-Irish Bank. And they had it in one stock. Um, and if we look back on that chart I showed you, the, the, the International Equity Fund at Zurich was down 30%. But I mean, if you're going into a fund, the risk is the economic risk of the whole world going down. But I think the big thing with pensions is really to understand where your money is going. So, um, you know, you need to make sure that you're investing in the world and you're investing in shares all around the world rather than one or two shares, which would make it a lot higher risk. But with all the insurance companies in Ireland, you can pick your risk. So Laura, if you're low risk or medium risk, you could say, oh, I want to go into a low risk or medium risk fund or maybe Karen, or maybe I'm, I'm getting these chats from Bruno. So maybe Bruno's high risk. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, everyone has a different risk profile. So, um, yeah, I would uh, like it also depends on your age, Laura, like, you know, if how long you have until retirement. I think a lot of people in, in, in this, you know, uh, presentation are have a long time until they reach retirement age. So, you know, you have to remember things are going to go up and down. Uh, but, you know, uh, a pension is a good way. Just make sure you're. Mm -hmm. You're making an informed decision with the pension. Um, I think Bruno, you had some questions on. I'm getting these. Sorry, did that answer the question, Laura? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, Bitcoin. I, I. I don't invest in Bitcoin myself. Um, I just find it too volatile. <laughs> um, how about these? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix. I suppose for shares, I don't give specific advice or I don't give advice because I'm not a stockbroker, but I, I do think, you know, a lot of those companies are very good companies. I have my own money in Netflix um, and my wife bought some Amazon there last year. So, um, and I think Facebook are good at a personal level. I think a lot of the big IT companies are, are good, you know, but um, yeah. <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> Got to be careful what I say.
<laughs> no, it's all good. I, I I think you know if you're buying stocks and shares, buy companies you believe in. But be wary, you know, it's high risk buying buying shares and and Bitcoin. I'm still struggling to understand that, so um, I don't put my, any money in there. eToro is the the platform. I use the gyro myself, so I, I'm not familiar with eToro. And then. Uh, thank you, uh, Owen, for your presentation. Bruno here. Thank you, VCM. Um, is there any, please help me to understand if there is any difference or if it's antagonistic or incompatible to get, let's like, say, 65 or 68 or 70 years old and apply and to get your official social welfare retirement and receive your pension, and at the same time, having baked or having prepared your individual private pension on an insurance company. Can they concur at the same time? And if so, they will accrue, they will accumulate in order that the state will try to squeeze money via revenue? So let me let me just get the get it clear in my head your, your question. So are you saying if you have a private pension, are you at risk of not getting your state pension? Yeah. What this is the first question, yes? Yeah, it's a fair question. So in Ireland, we have the, the situation is the state pension has moved from 65 to 68. Yeah. That's and there, we didn't really Irish people and Irish society didn't really fight to to not have that happen. So it's 68 for everyone in this room. But the other problem is like we have the youngest population in Europe. We will have the oldest population in Europe in 30 years time. So, and then the last problem is they have had the economic collapse in 2008, and then they have all the, the tax issues with the pandemic, having to pay all that tax money. So is the state pension sustainable? But currently, Bruno, if you have a private pension and it's worth 2 million or whatever, you can still get the state pension. But okay. what might happen in the future <laughs> I do not know. So they have two ways of calculating the pension, right? So they have the means tested. So it's based on how much wealth you have. And the other way is, have you paid in 40 years of tax contributions? Okay. 40, 40. Four zero, yes. So for me and you, you have to pay 40 years to get the full state pension of nearly 13,000 a year. So... But I mean, they take it from like, okay, you start work at 20, you finish work at 65, 68, whatever. Um, so people are coming from Venezuela or living in Ireland for a certain period of time. You're not necessarily guaranteed 13 grand a year. And even as an Irish person, I'm not guaranteed if I don't live in the country and pay my 40 years of tax, you know? So, um, but it's a good question. May I ask um, just a request you not to monopoly, not to monopolize the conversation? Owen, Karen, may I? Yeah, no problem. Okay, I am Italian, so I've been I have been paying in Latin America and other countries contributing to the Italian social welfare, and now I am living, working, and paying my taxes here in Ireland. So on on, on my due time, let's say let's say sixty eight. Can I invoke and call upon the portion of the of the, my contribution that I made to the Italian state plus the portion that I actually entered into the Irish state and say, guys, I have 45 years uh, accumulated of pension. So can you, can somebody of the social security, which is a insurance company, but public to pay me my monthly pension? Can, can it be accumulated to get one just single result? So what I would suggest, Bruno, what I would suggest that you do is you can write to the social welfare office oh, and okay. you can write to them and say, this is my situation. Um, I worked in Italy. I paid whatever uh, social welfare in Italy. Mm -hmm. Would I, could my time in Italy contribute to my 
for my credits in Ireland. Um, and I would write to them. There, there is a European wide agreement for social welfare. So, yeah. Yeah. Very but good. I would ask them the question. <laughs> and then you, ha you have the piece of paper in 20 years time and say, you told me. <laughs> good advice. Yeah, everything in black and white. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Grand. And um, I was wondering if Carlos and Alejandra have any question. So guys, this is the moment. It's a free advice, financial advisor. So <laughs> for I have a question. I have a question. Uh, it's not related to the pension, but it's about the mortgage. Uh, for example, for the bank, you, I have my credit card and I have also uh, my, I pay in my car as well. So if, before going into a mortgage, will be better to clear also the debt of the car. My, my credit card are very good. I don't have it really, I'm very, very good with them. But with the car, I still pay in my, my, uh, my loan. Okay. So what, what would you recommend in that case? So you have a, okay, you have a car loan. Um, see, the bank would t take the car loan as a, you know, they would take it as an expense. So I, I don't think they, it, it depends on how much you're trying to look for and whether the car loan has an impact on how much you want to borrow. Um, the bank doesn't necessarily see the car loan as a bad thing if you're paying it off every month and you're, you're, you're good with your repayments. Um, but I guess it, it depends on, I mean, there's no harm in, you know, I, what I would suggest, Laura, is maybe talking to a mortgage broker that knows this stuff and he can tell you, um, oh, I think you should clear the loan or because they have all these, you know, spreadsheets and stuff and they know the different banks and they can tell you, OK, this is what you, this is what you qualify before you clear the loan and this is what you would qualify after, you know. Because he was asked a bad loan. The car. In your presentation, the car loan was as a bad, de bad uh, debt. Yeah, I, I suppose car loans are a bad debt for you at a personal level because, you know, the car is going down in value and you're paying, but not a bad debt for a mortgage, you know, so. Yeah, because... Some of us probably got this kind of credit and um, um and loans to to construct like a, a credit reputation. I I might call it like that. And okay. then the um, the bank and the financial institution can see that we are able and we are you know people who are committed to pay our loans and to do it on time. So is that positive or is negative? What, do you, what do, you, do you think about it? Yeah, sorry, I should have been more clear in, in what I, my terminology for bad debt, uh, Karen and Laura. Um, it's not a bad, so, so debt isn't bad, okay? But I, I, I guess purely from a, your, your own personal wealth, so like the bank isn't going to see the the car loan as a bad debt. I mean, they make money on these car loans. They don't see the credit card as a bad one either. But I guess if you're looking at from a wealth perspective and, um, you know, uh, like you, when you buy a car and you borrow money, it, the car drops in value right away, but your your interest is going up. So that's why it's considered a bad debt because whereas if you buy a house, the house could go up in value and the interest could go up in value. So you're you're buying something that the return is going up and that's why it's a bad, that's why buying a house is a good debt potentially because it's going up. Whereas the bad debt is because the thing goes down or it, it, it doesn't give you a higher return. I don't know. Has that explained the question well or not? I don't know. Is that Chevre? 
Yes, and then one more question because I know there's a lot of people that are looking forward to get a loan just to create their own entrepreneurship or to uh, get their car or a uh, flora going for their mortgage. So we want you to give us an advice how to manage our uh, bank account the way that people can, uh, for, that the bank can see that we are able to get this. So for example, is it is it positive to have um, direct debit saving account? Yeah, yes. This is very positive. If, if you can show the bank that you're saving money every month, yes, extremely positive. And they generally go back six months or sometimes 12. And but... which one are the expenses that you don't recommend to do it directly on our debit card so the bank can see where we are spending our money? Like, for example, I don't know, going shopping Sara or something like that. Well, I, I think for the bank, the, the important thing is that like it, when they're looking at your accounts, they, they want you to see that you're clearing your credit card every month. Okay, so like if you... I don't know, like if I take myself as an example in college, I didn't clear my credit card. It was two grand outstanding. Whereas if you take out two or 300 euros on your credit card, that you clear it every month. That's that's important. But also that you live within your means. The bank want to know, OK, is Karen or Laura or Bruno or Melissa or Alejandro or Carlos, if your money is coming in. So like, I don't know, let's call them. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Diego over here and let's say it's not Diego that you know Karen or we'll use a different name I don't know we'll, we'll say Bob Bob is a better name so Bob earns three grand a month three grand a month comes into his accounts the bank want to know okay can Bob live off three grand every month or does he have to dip into the credit card or can he save a bit of that three grand because when you go for a mortgage, the bank want to be able to see that you can afford that mortgage. So if you're getting a mortgage of 1100 or 1200, do you have the capacity to, to pay for it? So they'll look at how much you're paying on rent. And then if the mortgage is going to be more than the rent or, you know, so they, they look at your capacity to be able to afford the mortgage. But like, if you ask me, is there anything specifically which would negatively impact your mortgage? If you have any gambling on your bank accounts, that's that's an immediate no-no. So, like, if you have anything on Paddy Power or, yeah, that's that's the only thing I really can, I know. Um, yeah. So, if you're gam if you, if you're a gambler, <laughs> do it in cash. <laughs> any. We have from the eToro uh, transactions. Is that positive or negative? I don't think it matters because you're you're investing your money. So um, no, I don't think that there's a problem with that. But uh, yeah, the banks are just very conservative. Um, generally, they borrow, they lend three point five times income, um, and then some of the banks give exceptions of four point five times your income. So. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I just wonder if there's one last question and we go. I have one. Okay, so, Melissa. Uh, what would you say it's better in my situation? As I cannot actually start with a pension program, not neither here or there, uh, but once me, for example, or one of you or one of the other guys, it's ready to start a, um, a pension program. Is it better to actually invest in the stock market after we have had uh, like education about it and where and when to stop and everything or actually uh, do a pension program, which provides you more like uh, more benefits like in a long time, like if you do hold in, for example. Um, sorry, so your question is, should you invest or exactly which one if i cannot do both uh you know if i could only do one uh would it be better to do just a pension program or actually give uh, do to do some investments instead um 
Okay, so I, I'm not too familiar with the American pension system, um, but pensions make sense because the your your growth is not taxed. So that's the big thing with pensions. So like, um, I'm sure in America it must be similar. So let, let, if you take Ireland as an example, if you invest your money, you get taxed uh, 33% on the growth. Okay. Whereas if I put money into my pension, like let's say you take 10 grand, and you, you make 10 grand on your pension. There's no tax on that until you extract it at the end where you're taxed income tax. But if I made 10 grand in Ireland, I'd be taxed 3,333. Um, so the big benefit of a pension is you don't get taxed on the growth. So, um, but the, the downside with pensions, Melissa, is you don't have instant access. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you can't access it until you're whatever, 60, 65, or sometimes 50 in Ireland, but like, yeah, that's, uh, but I, what I would say generally for a lot of people is explore both options and, you know, um, do a bit of both. And then as you get the hang of pensions, you'll understand them better. And then with uh, investments, you'll, you'll, you'll learn and, and hopefully make the right decisions as well. Okay, Bruno, this one is the last one. Uh, Owen, in the, in the current scenario that we are just enjoying a few weeks after coronavirus, is it a good moment to look for loans for capital investment or productive investment, startups, all that stuff? Is it a proper moment or we, or we should or should we wait until next year and see what is going to happen on the remaining part of this year? Is it a moment to start now or is it a moment to prepare for the next year? What do you think? Well, that's a good question. So, uh, like, if you have your own business, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I, I think it depends on the business, really. Do you know what I mean? Um, okay. But I think you can get really cheap loans right now because of the pandemic. Um, really? If you're a business owner, yeah, I think you can get as low as 2% or 1% interest um, depending on the business. So my view is, you know, if your business is, you know, you're not sure or... Infrastructure on strategic developments. Infrastructure and strategic developments. Um, I think infrastructure on, for strategic positioning of the country to avoid strategic weakness before other countries. I, 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 I get it, it, it's, it, it depends on the business. I think, I mean, it's, it's, I, 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 yeah, some bit, it's, it's, it's a tough question. Um, okay. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We at BCI, we are developing this project that is called BCI Learning, where we are willing to prepare different, um, workshops so we can learn and get so much information to uh, adapt and to get the best of um, what Ireland has to us. We hope that uh, all can join us for future events and future workshops. We would like you to leave us uh, comments on this uh, event post so you can tell us how uh, how was for you the experience of this workshop? And if you would like to learn something else or about it to go deeper, so on can enjoy it, uh, can teach us, or uh, we can find uh, some more people that can help us with our doubts in the future. Okay, nice to meet everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time, guys. Have a lovely weekend. Bye bye. Thank, thank you all. Bye bye. 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 Thanks. Take care. Uh, oh, could you please uh, stop the recording and